as Anne uh, introduced me, I'm Mieke Jans. Um, I got a PhD at Hasselt University, which is across the border in uh, Belgium, and there I applied both data mining and process mining in the context of fraud detection and prevention. So that's how I started to uh, digging in this process mining field, and after my PhD, I started working. Uh, part-time at Deloitte and part-time at university so that's where I got this combination of applying process mining in an auditing context. I started um, within the forensics team going further on this fraud context but now for the moment I uh, backed off from the forensics uh, and I uh, broadened my focus into uh, auditing and all operational excellence uh, projects where we can use process mining. So Anna asked me to talk a bit like, okay, how are you um, in, in, in practice applying process mining? What are the steps you're doing and what are the difficulties? So um, I made a few slides where I will talk on the seven steps that I see when we conduct a uh, process mining project. So the first step is that we conduct an interview with... Um, the client where we're going to do a process mining uh, project and so most projects are now in an audit context so apart from the operational excellence where I think the previous speaker more uh, put an emphasis on we're more looking from a, an audit point of view so the, the interview is not like uh, going to ask in detail like how is your process and doing the old way of auditing where you have to interview like tens of people just to have an idea of how is your process going on because that's what we're going to discover for them based on real data. But we have to nevertheless ask some basic questions like what are the main steps in your process, are you um, using the more standard approach because we're now focusing on uh, procurement and sales and SAP. Um, so we ask like what's your authorization process, are you using one, two, or multiple signatures, what's the threshold of approval, um, are there some exceptions in your company, are there some business case specific rules, so these kind of things uh, we ask during the interview, uh, also like intercompany invoices and these type of things that we have to filter out or take into account. And the next step um, this is a, a, a critical step, which may be a hurdle, is the data dump. Um, like I said, we're now focusing on SAP-based uh, clients, and we used to give them like, like a Word document, which clearly uh, describes what type of data we need. We tell them which SAP tables we need, which fields, and which selections and filters that they have to apply. Now, then the client needs to write an ABAP themselves, and of course they are not really happy with that. So now we developed a tool that we can go and do the extraction for them, or we are still wondering whether we should write our own ABAP file, but there are some problems, some issues that you can have uh, because uh, Deloitte um, is not always allowed. You just like give an ABAP file, if something goes wrong you can be responsible for that. So these are the, the issues that we have to take care of and uh, to ask our legal advisory <laughs> whether we are uh, okay to just give an ABAP file. So are we going to work with an own ABAP file that we're going to write ourselves or are we going to use uh, a, an extraction tool uh, that we developed? It's already developed. We're <coughs> now going to use it for the first time, I think, next month. Okay, so that's the data dump. It's It can be a hurdle, but nevertheless, it's uh, quite okay. Now we have the the expertise that we know which tables. But then step three is the event block creation. And this is an overview of how um, for the um, sales, to, sales to cash, so the um, revenue cycle in SAP, how all the data is related to each other. You have the sales order and the shipments and, and you have tables with header information, tables with item information. So you have a bunch of rela related tables. So actually in SAP, there's kind of a relational database. And for process mining, we need one nice table. Like, we need to put all these different tables with their relations into one flat file. So, flattening the reality. And so, this is for the moment the most um, labor intensive and time consuming step 
to make this manipulation. Um, don't, don't get me wrong with the word manipulation, I'm just meaning uh, formatting the data in another format. Um, so I did it already using SAS, um, ACL, we're now converting out uh, stuff into SQL. So it's just a matter of the analyst, uh, the language that he feels comfortable uh, to do all these transformations. Of course, this is repeatable if you, uh, more or less repeatable, if you stay on one process in one type of information system like SAP or Oracle. If you use the same information system, you're mining the same process, it's more or less repeatable. Okay. And then it's the nice part, and it's the process mining step. Um, from an audit point of view, um, we're doing mostly these um, different steps. I mean, I'm going through them uh, step by step. I'm not going into detail and in analyzing this particular case. I'm just giving you a brief overview, like what are the things that we are looking at. So in the first step, we're just giving the log des description about how many cases are we talking, what is the time uh, period that we're looking at, stuff like that, and the variance. Um, so the, the lowest uh, row is the, different, uh, the number of different patterns that are found within the log. So different ways of executing one and the same process. So this is the number that they are always shocked by. Because they assume like we have one clear process and there are maybe like six or come, let's exaggerate, there are like 15 different ways of executing this process. And if I then come and say like I found 1300 different ways of executing this process, they're like, this cannot be possible. Of course, it depends on how you set your fi filtering, etc., etc., but still it gives them some <coughs> sense of reality. Okay, then um, number of events over time. So you can see that at the right, at the bigger circle, you find all the peaks. Like this is the period of audit assurance that the auditor is saying, like, okay, everything happened well, more or less how it should take place. Uh, but uh, a trace can also start more uh, in the past in the history. Now what we next look at is uh, the top of the patterns uh, that are followed. And uh, again, I'm not going into detail into these patterns, but we see like the top two was already uh, covering 93% of the event log. So quite reassuring, like, okay, it's not like we have very, uh, very, uh, a lot of patterns to cover only the, the big bulk of uh, the process. So we're looking at the most frequent patterns, we're discussing them with, uh, with the auditors, with the domain experts, to check whether this is at least okay. And most of the time, in a regulated environment, this is the case. Then what we have a look at are, the, just to give some example, like the 10 traces with the longest trails. Uh, and then the auditor is going to have a look at that, like, okay, what's happening? How come that we have trails with, like, 6,161 activities on one purchase order? This is the purchase orders. Um, so this is all give, uh, as input for the auditor that they can more precisely conduct their audit. Instead of just taking a random sample, they now have a clear basis to start from, and we give them the cases that they say, okay, this is indeed interesting to have a look at. Look at. Now we give a, a visual model of um, the, the channel model. So we filter on the cases, like the 80 or the 90% of the cases that are, um, or the traces that are followed most often, so 80 or 90% of the event log. And then we get like a general model. Like generally speaking, you can see these and these flows. Now in this case, you see like you have the four cases with the very dark blue are the, the activities, the four activities, sorry, are the activities that are most often followed and you have the four with the lighter color not that often followed. So if you see these kind of things, we split our log and we say, okay, apparently we have two types of traces, the types with an approval strategy and the types without an approval strategy. So just based on your first finding, you can go and have further uh, splitting of your log and having a more focused way of looking at your data. So here, again, just um, giving this information that they have a clear view of, okay, this is what's going on in my company and most of the time, since you're working with 80 or 90% of your log, 
this is quite reassuring and, and confirming like okay most of our cases at least follow the process that we uh, intend to follow. Now we also provide them with this figure which they don't like that much as the previous figures because this figure is not based on 80 or 90 percent of the log but it's based on the complete log so it shows every single um, path that is followed or uh, f uh, following order between two activities is all sh uh, showed. And then w we sit together with the auditor, but I think that's my no, it's a slide further, but I still tell it now. <laughs> now we sit together with the auditor and we discuss based on this figure. Like, hey, we see an arc between these two activities. Is this normal? Is, is this allowed that after a second approval, a first approval uh, happens again or something like that? So based on this figure, we base uh, our audit tests. So instead of thinking out of our own, like, oh, as an auditor, it would be interesting to test this and this and this, we ask actually the data, like, which tests would be interesting to conduct for this company. And now we also have a look um, to go in a later phase to segregation of duty. We start with a role task matrix. Um, and like here, for example, with, the, with the blue, you find like person number 29, I anonymize it, um, apparently did 20 times a first sign signature, 80 times a second signature, and 549 times a third signature. So based on this matrix, we cannot conclude like, oh, there's an issue with segregation of duty. We only know that there are some persons that have the authority and use that authority to execute some activities which should not be combined on a single case. But based on this graph, we don't know whether they conducted the activities or executed these activities on one case. So this is only to confirm like, okay, in this company and in most companies, we have to go and test further for segregation of duty. And so this is actually one of the most important um, tests that we do when we collaborate with an auditor. And for example, this company, um, they had like this authority level of until 250 euro, only one signature uh, between 250, oh no, between 250 and 2,500, one signature, between 2,500 and 10,000, two signatures, and over 10,000, they needed three signatures as approval. So this is the information that you get out of the interview in step one, okay? And so we found with testing of segregation of duty, um, w which we do, <laughs> um, that we found 280 purchase orders uh, with a violation of the sign one, sign two segregation of duty, and one violation between the sign two and sign three uh, segregation of duty. Now, when we discussed this with the audit, uh, audit, People. I'm not going to say the audit committee because it was not the official audit committee but uh, with the internal and the external auditors together. Um, they said like, but actually you're only testing on sign one and sign two but if there's only one signature asked, required, and it's the same person as the one that created the purchase order. You have a signature, okay, but it's, if it's the same one who created the purchase order, you still have a problem. So actually we extended our, our testing because this is what you first think of. Um, but we tested a bit uh, further and then it was very interesting that we saw this company really had a, a big issue with segregation of duty. We found um, like 99 cases where about where the four activities create purchase order, the first signature, the second signature, and the goods received were all, all four executed by one and the same person. Um, cases without approval, so b below 250 euro threshold, uh, both create purchase order and goods received done by the same person. So when testing segregation of duties about talking about um, things that I did not understand in the beginning, I was so focused on having a look at the activities of approval that you forget to extend your view and say, like, okay, I don't only have to look at sign one, sign two, sign one, two, three. No, I have to include like create purchase order and uh, receiving the goods into the sign and approval activities. 
So, and then we were able to put a total amount on it, um, just reason of confidentiality. It was a big amount of money. I'm not going to put a number on it. But this is the type of information that we deliver uh, at our auditors. So, and then what we also do, but I don't have examples here, is that we test other internal controls. <laughs> and um, I put here that declarative language is very interesting for an auditor. Uh, Maybe a bit technical, but the technical people um, uh, at least know what I mean. It's just like the declarative language gives you the opportunity to say like, okay, um, everything can happen. I'm okay with everything as long as if activity B happens, it is preceded by activity A, for example. And so these type of uh, rules, declarative rules, are very interesting if a company says like, okay, we installed some extra internal control um, and we'd like to have like this activity only happens after that activity if person Z is involved, something like that. So these are the type of things that we then customize for the company, for the client, and uh, that we include in our auditing testing. And then also, um, l less, maybe less um, interesting for an auditor um, by himself, but the company and the client is always very interesting in this social network that they see, like, okay, are those two people working together? So we always provide this, uh, these nice figures, they like it. Uh, but the auditors, they, they cannot work very well with it. I mean, it's not a lot of... Uh, value added for the auditor, but it is for the client, so we're happy, happy to provide it to the client. Then, step five, um, after, so we did all this process mining, different techniques and all these different process mining uh, steps, we have a discussion together with the auditor, as I just said, so both, um, both the Deloitte auditor, because I'm not an auditor, uh, I'm just a, a data analyst, um, so I'm sitting together with the auditor from Deloitte and the internal auditor and then the people uh, responsible uh, to provide all the information to Deloitte for the audit. Um, we sit together and we discuss the results and then they might come forward, may, uh, come forward with things like, hey, why don't you extend like sign one and sign two to create PO, for instance. Uh, for instance. Um, so they might give some information and then step six is to process mining <laughs> to the second. So you restart your analysis and you extend it where uh, required. Of course, you're not doing everything from scratch again, but you elaborate and you extend some uh, process mining uh, analysis. And then there's a reporting. Uh, so we, we prepare a report only on the process mining results and it's integrated in the official auditing report um, and the Deloitte auditor is drawing its conclusions on itself. I'm just providing the uh, information based on the process mining and he's drawing the conclusion. So that's not up to me. I can give some, uh, some ideas, etc. But the uh, official auditing uh, side is, is not my part, so that's uh, for the auditor. So the process mining report is just integrated into the auditing report. And I think I then covered all my seven steps, uh, how we conduct a process mining project um, as part of in relation with an auditing. And uh, I thank you for your hands. Thank you, Mika. We have time for one question. <laughs> <laughs> The question is, um, is this um, uh, assisting in the understanding, when you look at the audit process, is this uh, assisting in the understanding of the business, in the compliance testing, or in the, in the substantive testing? I think, because I'm not the auditor, but I think they put it in the substantive testing. Right. Okay. Okay. okay, one one more question then, <laughs> Antonio. No, we can, we can wait for no, no, I have to change slides anyway, so ah, please. Okay. <laughs> yes, the, you told that the, that the, the big uh, amount of of time that you dedicated for the for the, this kind of uh, process meaning is the um, the data dump. 
can you put, give us a, 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 an order of magnitudes? Are you talking about months? Are you no, talking no. About um, years, days? <laughs> <laughs> um, it took me a few months uh, the first time to figure out the whole relational, uh, the relations between all the tables in within SAP. But these months include all the waiting time between the interviews. I was a PhD student and uh -huh. I'm very sure that if I would go now and they have to pay me for each interview, <laughs> that I would have my, inf my information immediately. But as a PhD student, I had to wait like two, three weeks in between that I had the right persons. So it took like eight to nine months for me to combine and make this picture okay these are the tables and this is the result that because I had the people from the front end users the process users at SAP and the IT people to combine so that was a first investment but now I know the structure so this is not the biggest amount of time now it's more the, the time and I'm talking like one work week at most for the company um, to extract this data uh, but now the biggest time uh, amount of time is in the creating the event log not the data dump anymore okay thanks yeah. okay let's well one one more <laughs> <laughs> you're very interesting thank you very much um, okay. I've done this job around about 50 times over the last three years with SAP my question is looking on the number of data you have on the number of activities did you use the change documents or yes. it looks like the very basic time stamps from the basic tables no no for the change log okay yeah but I don't know which uh, which case I presented, so it might be that it's like one month that I put the descriptives on. And the table relations you showed, I think, was page 23 from a very famous document from the internet. Um, that was the order to cash process, yes. the order to cash order tables. To cash. But your presentation was about purchase to pay? Yes, yes. Okay, so it was different. Yes, I, uh, <laughs> I switched those. Okay. That was just by mistake, sorry. <laughs> why, why are you using your data, data, own data extraction tools and that's stuff like DAV exporter or smart exporter, I mean, it, there are functional tools out there. Yeah, that has to do with the legal aspect of uh, Deloitte getting into a company and using other software. It's just for that. Yeah, let's discuss this in the break. Okay. We can continue about it. Thank Th you. Thanks a lot, Mika.